Paul Devlat here. Welcome to Cat Pick Fridays, episode number 39. And once again, I'm joined by Mr. Richard Morgan. Richard, will this episode be the most viewed episode ever? Unlikely. Or yes, <laughs> to answer in a slightly different way. Because of course it will. Because every episode we do is better than the last one and therefore receives more views. Or at least that's the logical way that I like to look at it. Now I live in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, uh, if my voice sounds a bit different, which is <clears throat> probably does, uh, I got a bit of flu going on, so yay. And I was actually supposed to get my flu shot next week, so this is really cool. Like a few days before that, this happens. But what are you going to do? timing, I guess. But luckily, yeah, had... we're social distancing by about 500 kilometers, so I'll be okay. Is that... Did you do the math? Are we actually like that far apart? I have no idea, by the way. No, I guess. I, we're probably further than 500 kilometers, aren't we? I'm going to say it's further than that, because I think... Probably a thousand kilometers. A thousand sounds more close. Which is also enough. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna not gonna get any particles from my breath or like exhales onto you or something like that. I don't know where I'm going with this, but yeah. Thank you so much for watching, listening, subscribing, liking, sharing the show with your friends as well. And we got something special as I hit the microphone. And as you just noticed, we used the unlikely phrase. Well, check this out. What is it? Unlikely is a merch brand now. <laughs> There's unlikely hoodies. There's unlikely mugs. There's unlikely t-shirts. And as soon as they finally like, confirm my submission, uh, there will be... Yeah, Rich is holding his unlikely t-shirt there as well. Uh, as soon as they kind of confirm my design, there should be unlikely snapbacks as well my phone is ringing by the way gonna mute that uh yeah there will be unlikely like snapback caps as well unfortunately i wasn't able to get one for this show and to celebrate this unlikely launch of things <laughs> uh you can get 20 percent off from of any items in the catpick studios merch store by using the code podcast upon checkout and i gotta say uh, these things from I'm using Teespring. Uh, these are actually like fairly high quality. Uh, I've had the Catpick Studios hoodie for almost two years now. The print I've I've used it a lot. The print hasn't worn off almost at all. By the way, I'm going to show the store here on the YouTube version. Like the print on this Catpick Studios hoodie, uh, it's still fully intact. It's it's been very durable. It's very comfortable. It's warm. And for the 43 euros, uh, from which I'm getting like five, maybe if you buy it, buy it at full price, uh, it's really good. Same goes with the for the mug as well. Uh, the print is still there. Uh, actually, like on all of these items, the prints and everything are still very well intact. So they're surprisingly high quality. And yeah, I, I um, think if I also like Teespring stuff. We did, mm. when I was working with Hughes and Kettner, we had a, a Teespring store. Well, I think the brand still has that Teespring store. And, of course, we ordered sample shirts and stuff, and they were fine. Totally cool. The T-shirts, yeah. at least the ones that we did, and I, I guess the unlikely ones as well are 100% cotton, which for me personally is always a nice thing. I don't really like wearing T-shirts made out of polyester or acrylic or whatever. And so yeah. I like them a lot. The medium or the large fits me, depending on what size of, what sorry, what style of shirt it is and... The designs, the prints, they stick around longer than most band shirts, I would say. So, yeah, I like them. I would say this has been a pretty unlikely story, the whole getting this merch thing, but it <laughs> it looks cool. And I would say now the only unlikely thing is that this will not be the number one Christmas gift across Europe this year. That is true. It's very unlikely yeah. that this won't be the hit product of 2021. It just makes yeah. sense. Uh, and I mean, I, I I love being able to use this very <clears throat> spontaneous thing that happened. Like uh, the unlikely word uh, stems from that uh, 
which were not guitar that combat yenis.com maybe i think we're checking yeah, out the jo yeah, king of kings pedal and in the article whoever wrote the article said that like will this enjoy your pedal sound like the king of tone pedal and then there was like one word reply unlikely and <laughs> that's it and we just rolled with that yeah so, so if anyone gets this merch you'll be in the the small exclusive club of people including us who found that amusing so yes, good luck to exactly you. It doesn't get more exclusive than this, I, I want to say. If you <laughs> no. end up getting anything from the store, uh, please share your photos on social media and tag us, and we'd love to see you wearing this. I remember, like, well, hello there shirts back in the day. Like, I got tagged quite a few times, and that was fun. And that shirt is also available there. Uh, for whatever reason, the, show, uh, the shop is showing two unlikely designs, but that should be fixed. Uh, very soon. I'm not sure why they're still there, but I'm going to take a look and make sure. Uh, Can you get yeah. them in different colors or just black? Uh, there's a few different colors. Uh, with the hoodie, I think there's black. There's like, what? what's this? It's like navy blue, I think. It's yeah. purple. Or, mm -hmm. And uh, I want to see the front. And then there's, I think this is like dark, like gray. Does that? Yeah, it's like a, it's like like a gray have... green. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is weird. Like, like you can see the snapback over here, but it's not in the store. I'm I'm, I'm gonna check this. But oh, the yeah, snapback is that, the snapback's really cool. Yeah. This is. I would like, like to get I a want snapback. this. And I think it should be like it should actually be like what's the word? Embro something embroidered or something embroidered? like that. Yes, I think that's how the text should be on this one. And I like how you went for that word. It's something like Mbaba, which was close. Mbaba. <laughs> That's how people will speak English in about 200 years when everything has been contracted into the quickest, easiest way to say it. Yes. Mbaba. We just need like two, two letters for each of the words and we know what everyone else is thinking right away. Yeah, I, I'm going to check the store what's going on there. But like, yes, snapbacks actually are there. They've, for whatever reason, not being displayed on the featured products page I, cool. i'm gonna fix that and add the snapback and my snapback should be on the way as well i really want that i also yeah love i really to have uh yeah mm -hmm. i want a snapback too so i'm gonna have yeah. to sort one out at some point yeah uh, i'd love to have a beanie as well but for now i haven't been able to find a design for that because i mean wearing random hats on this show has kind of become a thing today i'm actually not wearing hats so I need a new one. One of these you days. Do. Maybe for next one, I'll get the snapback already. So that'd be cool. But I got the mug and the hoodie and they are good. This mug is also high quality. Feels like it. So, yay. That's merch. Mm -hmm. Good start. I but like it. Good, good start indeed. Uh, I think we actually need to dive into the actual content as well. But before that... I also forgot to mention that there's timestamps. If you want to jump to a certain section of the show, timestamps exist both on YouTube and on podcast platforms where you can listen to this as well. So if there's a certain topic you want to dive into, feel free to jump there. And a quick recap of what's going on today. First of all, we're going to dive into Simon Neal's Peral, which is like a fast distortion thing. There's a version 2 out, I think. There's that. Uh, there's new e ah, sorry. There's a Supro Royal one by twelve combo. Uh, three new ESP LTD signature models. CBS Fender article where uh, we kind of go through differences between all of these guitars, uh, which was actually I don't, what's the word enlightening because I there were a lot mm -hmm. of things that I didn't realize about these different Fender models. That was cool. Uh, then there's a fun article on, I got a cheat, uh, I think it was at, on guitar.com where they go through five like pieces of guitar gear that were lost. And yeah, five, five pieces of iconic guitar gear. There's like a James Hetfield amp and stuff like that. And those were lost. And there's like little stories about those. That's, that was fun. Uh, we're going to dive into guitar.com's Christmas shopping guide. Uh, 
I can guarantee right away that we're not going to agree with all of the <laughs> picks they had. So <laughs> that's fun. There's Rich's album pick for albums of our lives. We're going to answer a few of your questions Woo! and comments. It's a good one. And then there's the weekend watch, which actually ties very closely to or with the questions and comments as well. So are we ready to get rolling? I think we Let's are. Let's get ready to rumble. Yes. Yay. <laughs> he said with such enthusiasm. With true passion, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what we do here on the show. All right. First of all, Simon Neal of uh, Biffy Clyro, if you didn't know, he has a signature pedal, which is called Boom with four O's. Boom slash Blast 2.0 pedal is out. And the original one was just a limited 200 unit one, and it sold out pretty quick. So they decided to do 200 more. Why not? And I'm trying to remember whether there was anything different about this than the first one. Uh, the looks, maybe, I think. Yeah, but apart from that, I believe it's effectively exactly the same, yeah. Yeah. And it's basically like a fast slash distortion thing. Like if you've ever watched like Rick Down Ryan Downs with Simon Neal, he at least used to use like a metal zone into I'm not I don't I'm forgetting which amp it was, but it was like a metal zone and a strat and what else was there? Like yeah. He has a fairly unique sound, I wanna say. He does, you know, for someone who is kind of iconic now in the, the British alt-rock world for playing a Fender Strat pretty much the whole time. Going through yeah. a metal zone was one of his unique tricks back in the day. And now he has this one. So I'm yeah. kind of surprised that he's never really had signature pedals or anything else up to this point. I mean, they, they have had guitars. There was a Squire signature Simon Neal Strat. And there was also a Squire James Johnston bass back in the day as well. And they were both supposed to be uh, great instruments. For the money the strap was red which i think put a few people off but it was really really good and they sell for quite high prices on the used market these days yeah and yeah now he has a pedal and the pedal is called boom blast and that of course refers to the song boom blast and ruin which is also misspelt which was on the <laughs> only revolutions album i think yes the only revolutions yeah. album and yeah he got the original pedal a year or so ago it's from a small company called, is it Golden Fish Pedals? Sorry, um, Gone Gun Fishing Fish. Effects. Gone, Gone Fishing Effects. <laughs> and the founder of Gone Fishing Effects is Richard Pratt, who is known as Churd, who is Simon Neal's longtime guitar tech. So that's how ah. he's managed to get Simon Neal on board to do this pedal. And I would actually recommend anyone who's interested in hearing how this pedal sounds to check out the video he did with that pedal show, where he does a bit of a rig rundown. That. He played the first version of the pedal and he makes it sound great i mean simon neal is a unique guitar player i was a massive biffy fanboy as you guys will know if you've watched this show before back in the day and i'm not such a huge fan of theirs these days the, the album which they just released this year is is all right but um yeah his heavily distorted sounds were kind of a bit marmitey you know strat into a metal mm. zone is never going to be everyone's cup of tea but um i loved it i loved their songs back in the day and this pedal is very limited edition. It's going to cost £300, which is about $400. It will be pretty limited. Yeah. It was released on November 30th, so two or three days ago, as of you seeing this. And I'm guessing it's probably already sold out because they only made a couple of hundred <laughs> units. Can yeah. you click the link, actually, Vlad, to see if it's already sold out or if there's any still available? Uh, Just at the bottom of the article there. Yeah. Oh, that's an ad. Oh, my God. Nice. What? Nice. Oh yeah, there you go. Thanks, Sold Arthur. out at the official Biffy Claro store ah, already. So there you uh, go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those went fast then. I mean. Yeah, and they'll be on reverb for five hundred pounds right now. Yes, that's the way and the market somebody goes. Somebody has probably already bought a few on reverb yeah. as well. So welcome. I'm actually going to check reverb world. right now and see if there are any. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what you think about the pedal. Actually, we've talked about. The circumstances, what do you think of the actual pedal? Looks cool. Looks unique. Uh, the From design standpoint, like, that's like, 
just this weird like red line across the pedal or on the packaging and then just like a brush stroke and then there's like a quick signature uh, and that's it yeah oh right. sorry i thought you were thinking that what you were thinking was his signature because he has that just kind of he writes the s backwards and an i but yeah that is the uh, that's the look of the pedal yeah i guess it's related to the artwork from back in the day biffy have also always had extremely for me extremely eye-catching and unique artworks they used to work a lot yeah. with uh an artist who probably must have been Scandinavian called Storm Ferguson, who did a lot of the Pink Floyd mm. iconic album covers, did a Mars Volta album cover, etc. And he he made some great covers for Biffy back in the day. Yeah, looks cool. Uh, I love this. Like I watched the that parallel show episode where the they actually had him on the show, and it sounded amazing. It, it's a very unique. And maybe a bit uh, specific, like it's a spe specific sound for him, but I could see people using that for other stuff as well. So that's yeah, really exactly. Cool. And in a positive turn of events, I just searched reverb on the side, and there don't seem to be any of these there. So hopefully, they've all been snapped <laughs> up by fans and or people who will actually want to use the pedal. So that's cool. I yeah, like that. That's true. But yeah, cool release. Uh, we're gonna keep our eyes. Uh, on the YouTube feeds and see if somebody actually, like some of the YouTubers have got one and are doing like videos and that should be fun. Check it yep. out. Looks cool. Would love to try one out, but it's not going to happen. They are sold out already. So well done. Biffy Clyro or Simon Neal and Gun Fishing Effects. Love the name. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, jumping into the next thing, Supro has released the new Supro Royale 1 by 12 50 watt tube amplifier with super cleans, according to kidnews.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a clean Likely. amp with a lot of head, headroom. So it's basically a 1 by 12 combo that can be either class A 35 watts or class AB 50 watts. There's three 12x7s and 12AT7 and a 12DW7. That's an, a preamp tube. I don't know. And two 5881 power tubes in the power section. Sounds like a clean amp to me. <laughs> yep, yeah. that's what it's going to be. A loud, loud clean amplifier. Yeah. As with also pros, it looks really cool. I like the design a lot. We have zoom in on here on YouTube. That like, just the control panel is so beautiful. Yeah, the design is lovely. It's it's very retro. I, I guess this is exactly how they looked back in the day. And these yeah. amps are going to appeal to a very specific kind of player, I think, aren't they? Definitely not for everybody yeah. in 2021, an amp like this, because if you just need a nice clean amplifier to play at home and you have limited volume levels that you could achieve, I believe that this is going to be kind of out of the question. Yeah. Yeah, my question is, like, who is this for? Like, what are the places where you can still use something like this? I mean, and they have a I master guess, volume control, but, that's, you yeah. know, it's it's not to sure. be played quietly, is it? Yeah, I'm guessing it's not. Seems like it has an effects loop, there's, like, a boost function as well, there's a built-in reverb. It has a lot of things in it. That's really nice. So. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, does it have built-in effects, too, or is it just... A bit of reverb. Uh, there's a reverb and a boost, but I don't think there's anything else. Okay, well, uh, that's pretty cool, I guess. I yeah, mean, we, Supro has done a couple of quite decent pedals in recent years. You know, they've done a reverb pedal, they've mm. done a delay pedal, an analog delay, and they've been very well received. They're quite expensive for, for what they are, simple pedals, but yeah. well-made, great sounds, etc. And it would have been interesting to see maybe the delay in this amp or something to differentiate it slightly, but I feel that, mm. you know there are Supro fans out there who will lap this kind of thing up. Yeah. I mean, it's not are they, uh, super No, I was going to say, yeah. $1,500 is it's a kind of a mid-price. I'm assuming that these mm. are made in the USA. Could that be a false assumption? I'm not sure. Can mm. we see where they're built? I'm, I don't miss anything about this anywhere, but... Can you see the back panel anywhere? It would would be written on there, I guess. 
Uh, no, no photos of the back panel actually. Interesting. Oh. Okay. For this money, I'm guessing it's made in US, but I don't know. You, you, you would think so can have a bit of Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. But if you, you know, if you if you like vintage clean tones, something a bit different from Fender, Supro is a great choice. I, I agree with you yeah. totally, Vlad. Where I'm kind of wondering, you know, where <laughs> the best usage case is for amps like this. But for yeah. people who want it, it's it's the perfect choice. My last strong memory of Supro is unfortunately not a good one because I remember they were at the second GitCon event at uh, Warwick and Framus in Mark Neukirchen in yeah. the deepest, darkest depths of East Germany. And yes. they had a a little stand there alongside some of the other brands and they had a, a really nice guy there from the USA who was kind of the rep for the amps and who was playing them but he was playing them extremely loudly for the entire duration of the event. And, you know, it sounded great, and he was a great player, and as I said, a lovely guy. But after four days of having a cranked Supro amp in your face from about six yeah. or seven meters away, you wanted to commit crimes to, to stop that noise. So <laughs> that's my last memory of that. Yep. Exactly. But I mean... Looks cool. Would be fun to try one out. Don't know if we have a Definitely. dealer in Finland. So, if somehow I end up being at NAM twenty twenty two, then maybe there we shall see. Yeah, if NAM happens but, next year. Yeah, if it happens, it's still a big if. Imagine yeah, all the new the gear that we've talked about <laughs> since the last one that we're going to have to try out. There's going to be hundreds of videos that need to be made or companies that need to be met. It's yeah, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, if. fingers crossed that it will happen. Uh, jumping to the next thing, ESP LTD. Oh, oh, you're crossing your fingers. I thought you were asking for permission to speak. <laughs> Can I ask a question? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, for those who are just listening, Rich just raised his hand and he was crossing fingers for now to happen. Uh, yeah. Three new ESP LTG signature models for Sammy Duet, uh, Alan Ashby, and Javier Reyes. Uh, <laughs> I have to admit, I don't know any of these three players. But... I do. I knew two of them. Oh. You, that, you should be impressed. There you go. Ha. I'm very so impressed. We have, yeah, new signature ESPs for Sammy Duet, Alan Ashby, and Javier Reyes, or however you pronounce it. And Alan Ashby, I knew, is the or one of the two guitar players in Of Mice and Men. And I know Of mm. Mice and Men because I worked with Phil Manansela, who is the other guitar player, did some interviews with him because he played Hughes and Kettner amps back in the day. And I think he still does. And Javier Reyes, I know, is the guitar player that no one ever talks about from Animals as Leaders because he's not <laughs> Tosin Abasi. <laughs> but he's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, the so, other chap, uh, Sammy Duet, we didn't know. Can we say the name of his band on this family-friendly show? Uh, I'll leave that up I, to you. We, I guess we gotta say it once. So he's part of the band called Goat Horse, or Goat Whore. <laughs> Not Goat Horse. That's two nice farmyard yes. animals. He's from Goat Whore. Yeah, <laughs> which is a band that wasn't named to get play on daytime radio, but you know that that's, that, that is that's true. what they are. Yeah, so three yeah. very pointy, very metal, very heavy-looking signature ESP models. And for people uh -huh. who like that kind of music, they, they will be rejoicing because we have a lot of choice here. We have some pretty cool specs. And for me, the most interesting is the one that you have on screen right now, the Javier Reyes one. It's very PRS-like, which is interesting. It is, isn't it? But it's not multi-scale. So it's like a seven-string, this kind of PRS style shape. Uh, uh, that headstock is also, I think I've seen that on some LTDs, but it's not like, Yeah, it's a more rare one, one on, to be seen on an LTD or ESP for that matter. 27 inch scale. And yeah, it's a seven string and very strong PRS vibes. But I like that. that that's, like I don't remember this guitar from PR or like ESP's uh, catalog. So if like they bring back some older model as a signature guitar, I like that. Yeah, it has a hip shot bridge as well, and it has his signature Javier Reyes 
Fishman open core humbucking pickups. So for me, that's a proper pro decent instrument. I presume it's tuned yeah. in sort of baritone tuning with the 27 inch scale, but I'm not familiar with what they tune to. Yeah. But it costs $1,999. Like so, you know, premium price for what is undoubtedly a premium instrument. Yeah, if it would if it would be a ESP, it would be like 4K, I think. So still... Yeah, exactly. This is LTD by ESP. So yeah, this is the budget version yeah. of this guitar. <clears throat> yeah, but like LTD doesn't like scream cheap in my eyes anymore, at least. Like I've... I've had the LTD EC1000. That was like a professional level gigging instrument. Yeah. For around like 1,000 euros at the time at least. So why not? Uh, then there's the LTD SD2. This is a bit... This is one of those guitars you could kill an attacking polar bear with high pole <laughs> ninja. This is for yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> it's very funny. It's uh, this... Uh, it's not an explorer shape, but it's even more aggressive. I think I've seen this model from ESP before. Um, there's a what's its name? Uh, uh, Shu Su from a Japanese power metal ba band Galnerus, or however you pronounce it. He, I think he okay. used to at least play these type of guitars. So, yeah, very like expo explorer taken to a point here. Yeah. <laughs> The level, I'd say. <laughs> I think they have someone else on their artist roster, or at least had, who had this guitar shape as well, but it was like covered in like blood, uh, like splatter or something like that from one of the bands I'm just forgetting right now. Maybe so. this was just this guy's guitar after a gig, because that's the kind of thing that happens in the front row at a Goat Horse concert. Yeah. I'm saying goat horse now, by the way, because that's a family-friendly term, and it just makes me think of being down at the the petting zoo for a day. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting to note that this one is an ESP custom shop model, and it's only fifteen hundred dollars, which, in comparison, is is very affordable. I mean, it has less stuff on it, of course. You've got the yeah. an ebony fingerboard, twenty-four extra jumbo frets, mahogany body, three-piece neck through mahogany neck. Glow in the dark side markers were good for those dark stages to avoid you getting too much blood on the instrument during the set. And you get the single <laughs> Seymour Duncan blackout active humbucker and a Floyd Rose. Uh, so it's for one thing and one thing only. As Guy and News say in the article here, when you play in a band called Goat Horse, you don't tend to rock a Telecaster. I agree. Yeah, definitely. But I have to clarify a little bit. It's the recreation of his ESP custom shop. Oh, sorry. Model. I got that wrong. Yeah, yeah. it's the LTD2. The LTD yeah. SD2. So, it's, a, it's a recreation of his custom shop model. That explains the price. Apologies. Yeah, $1,500 for that one as well. And the third one, gotta say, this is cool. LTD AA1. Is that a, it's a six string, this kind of telecaster type of guitar? A very simple one humbucker in the bridge yep. volume, a half of like tunema is that like the bridge and then there's like a string through tailpiece or like it's a string through body yeah. design. I like these yeah, type of signature guitars. It's unique, very simple, but kind of cool. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of rare these days to see a signature guitar from someone where it's actually a really unique instrument that they actually mm. previously used. But I believe that Alan Ashby was using guitars similar to this. And yeah. this one actually reminds me quite strongly of the Mick Root signature Oh, guitars. that's true. It does. You know, just a pure hard rock slash metal telly style guitar with a, with a humbucker in it. Single volume control. That's all you need. This is probably a great guitar. And while I was more attracted to the idea of the Javier Reyes one, I think that if yeah. I was to get one of these three, the Alan Ashby one would probably be closest to the kind of music that I play. It would probably be mm. most comfortable for me to, to get used to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the this only is thing the I most don't, affordable I'm... of the three as well. $1,299. Yeah. Again, we're looking at LTD by ESP. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'm not a huge fan of is the EMG81 pickup in the bridge, but that's just me. And you can always swap that, so 
not really a problem. Cool guitar. I like that. Yeah, three interesting additions to the to the catalog there. Yeah. Uh, is it just me that, or does it, does it feel like uh, ESP's like presence isn't as strong as it used to be? Let's say ten years ago, maybe because of YouTube or something. Because I remember, like back in the day, they were like, it was like they were one of the biggest ones, especially like all of the metal stuff I was following. Like they were the guitar brand for all the metal guitarists. Yeah, I would agree. I totally know what you mean. I think back in the day, there were a lot more players who were more visual in using those instruments before the days yeah. when everyone just watched YouTube the whole time. And nowadays, at least when I'm looking at heavier modern metal sort of players, you tend to see these newer brands which are more sort of internet focused. You'll see a lot of solo yeah. guitars these days. You used to two or three years ago see quite a lot of Chapman guitars. That seems to have gone the other way a bit. You don't see quite as many Chapmans these days, but you'll see other things like Kiesels as well for heavy stuff. I think players yeah. just moved in a slightly different direction. For me, ESP and LTD are still very much there, but I totally agree that they, they're not kind of this sort of ubiquitous presence when it comes to metal bands these days. Yeah. Yeah, just something that, like, started thinking about that as we went through these guitars. But to me, they still feel relevant and nice and, like, if you would get a signature guitar from ESP, that's a very big company to support you. I bet they have nice resources for the signature artists as well. And oh, yeah, absolutely. For example, like, people are still, still interested in their guitars as well because like we talked about the uh, Alex Elijah signature guitars a few weeks ago. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, past Alex Lyle, like I think they sold out like all of the premium versions of his guitars just sold out right away. Yeah, that's great. And I think so, one thing that they're doing very well is actually working with relevant touring artists. Obviously, no one's yeah. really touring right now because of COVID. But you know, picking players from bands like this who do a lot of live work, it's there's a certain respect that comes with that. When you think about, yeah. for example, a newer brand like Solar Guitars, they have one sort of you know famous face behind them, Ola England, who is, of course, himself a hugely respected touring guitarist or whatever, and they have to build up the brand, yeah. whereas ESP, LTD, they've gone for three guys who are in kind of... They're at the top of their game for the kind of music that they produce. Yeah. Yeah. Cool instruments, and I like the fact that there's like... These are still... Like pricey, but when I bet the people who are or like the artists themselves are playing this, exactly the same guitar, it's not like you're getting like the budget version of that guitar. You get pretty much, you're yeah. most likely getting exactly the same guitar, and I like yeah. that. Something that I also saw with uh, oh, what's the name Kiko from Megadeth? I think he's like he's playing the I like the Ibanez that you can also buy as well. Like he has a signature model. And you can buy exactly the same guitar. There's also like a way, way more affordable budget version coming, but you're pretty much able to get exactly the guitar he's playing. And I, I love that. That's really cool. Yeah, I agree. That It's really cool to see yeah. a, a signature artist playing and using their own signature instrument because you know that they're really yep. into it then and it's not just you know a financial incentive for them to work with a company or something. Yep. Let's learn a bit more about Fenders. Uh, there's a cool article on guitarworld.com, CBS Fender Telecasters, what you need to know. <laughs> I like that. What, what, what's the post headline? Like this? Is it the excerpt? No? How, how is it called? Uh, journalism terms. What, what, what is this part of the article called? So there's the title, and then there's this little bit. Which is the headline? the The top one is the headline, and this one, which you're highlighting, is the the subhead. Oh, that's how ah, I learned subhead. it. There you yeah. go. Yeah, let's go with subhead. So the subhead says custom Telecaster or Telecaster custom question mark. We clear up the confusion of the CBS era tellies. Um Yeah, basically, the article mentions that tellies have been around since 1950s, and there's been so many different models. And it's very easy to get confused with all the names and terms how like how Fender is naming all of these guitars. What what's a telecustom? What's a 
uh, custom tilly or what's a thin line and stuff like that, and they go into those. And I guess the summary is first of all, thin line telecast is the one which is like it's like half hollow, like the one side of the guitar is hollow, or it's not fully hollow, but like I think, unless I'm mistaken. <laughs> I'm here That's to why we both the... need to read the article because I also that don't know true. with a hundred percent certainty. There are an awful lot of different Telecasters, and you know when you talk about a custom Tele or a Telecaster custom, it is a little bit confusing. I have to agree. I, I'm definitely yeah. going to read this article after this because I love Tellies, so do you, and I feel like yeah. I should know more about them. Yeah. Uh, actually, the article doesn't say whether it's semi-hollow or hollow, but... A thin line telecast is pretty much always there's like an F hole on one side at least. That so was always my like understanding hole. of a thin line yeah. telly. It has an F hole. It's got part yeah. of the body is hollow at least. Yeah. Yes. Which results in a, I want to say a bit rounder and softer sound. Yeah. At least in my experience. So that's cool. Uh, then there's the Paisley one. Uh, what? Where does the Paisley like this? flower pattern like originate from that's my like i know the page uh, is like a pink one and blue one usually yeah but. i assumed it originated in japan and it was literally oh. wallpaper which was put on the guitars and then <laughs> lacquered over because it so, looks like that actually <laughs> sorry yes, yeah makes sense. it was it was a kind of wallpaper I, I actually don't know where the the very original ones came from but these days they're kind of they're a cult thing among country players and telecaster enthusiasts yeah. you can get the odd official fender one but there's a bunch of american companies that make amazing ones i guess brad paisley is the most famous telly sort of country player these days and he has some telly models which are Paisley and different other could have sort of beautiful designs. And there is a yes. company called Crook who makes his custom instruments. He plays Fender yeah, stuff as well. He has signature Fender tellies and a Fender Esquire signature as well at the moment, which are both supposed to be great. I haven't played either, but he has Crook guitars as well, and they look like this. And it's kind of a bucket list instrument for me, I think. Uh, which one would you go for, the pink or the blue one? It's a really hard choice. I, as I understand, you can only get them with maple necks. And for some reason, yeah. that sort of pushes me towards the pink. But it's such a kind of mood guitar. You know, you've got to be a brave <laughs> person to step on stage with a pink Paisley Telecaster. And it's kind of a yeah. thing that if you could find a really, really good one for an affordable price, I feel like I would go for it. But it would be a huge investment for me right now, and I'm not ready to make that investment. So if I'm ever a, a rich man one day in more than just my name and I can just say I'll buy one of those it would be probably a pink Paisley yeah. Telecaster they're, they're beautiful is the, Brad, is the Brad Paisley Paisley Telecaster called the Paisley Paisley because it no. should be it should be actually his signature tellies are not Paisley um, one of oh, them yeah, had a Paisley true. scratch plate if I remember it was a silver sparkle his original one and it was a Fender Road one telly yeah but I'd have to yeah. research I kinda, to get exactly I, what they I kind of really enjoyed the, the... We talked about this a few episodes ago. Fender had like a limited run of... What was the Acoustasonic... The Acoustasonic Tellies had the... Pay, like there was a limited Paisley edition. That looked really cool. I think they had a black one, by the way. So not yes. there was like a pink and a black one. Yes. There have been a couple of black an almost silver burst sort of black paisley strats and tellies in recent years and they're lovely i've seen yeah. one in person it was about a thousand euros i think it was a japanese one it was a strat and i saw that at a shop called station music here in germany and it was beautiful but i didn't get the chance to play it or test it out which is probably a good thing so i probably would have had to buy it so lucky me <laughs> <laughs> yeah you saved yourself from ruin or something like that i did all right the next one on the list is the telecaster custom and the Telecast the custom apparently is like it has like, like a traditional tele bridge pickup, but then there's a wide range humbug in the neck. And this is this was something that I didn't know like that that's supposed to be the Telecast custom. 
That's what and I think of as being a custom. Yeah. But I, I also thought there could be a version with two humbuckers, which I also, in my head, call a Telecaster custom. Yeah. And also, like, this one has, like, four, kind of, like, Gibson-style four, so, like, two volumes, two tones, and the pickup selector is, like, where it's on a Les Paul, for example, so, like, is that the upper horn or however you want to call that? Yeah, exactly. I, I always thought that the dual humbucker version with the four knobs and with the selector switch up there was Fender's take on a Les Paul from back in the day. Yeah. And is that one called a Tele Custom or is that called like a Telecaster Deluxe or something? Uh, this seems to be called the Telecaster and then the one with two wide range humbuckers is called Telecaster Deluxe. Ah, the according Telecaster to this Deluxe. article like, at least. So the same control layout, but a different bridge because uh, it has two wide range humbuckers, so not like a traditional tele bridge on this one. Uh, yeah, uh, usually these Telecaster Deluxes I think come with the bigger headstock as well, so the seventies headstock. Yeah, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it does suit this particular guitar looks wise. Yeah, I like it. I've got nothing against the seventies headstock. Headstock headstock headstock. Of heads, uh, yeah. We just got an ad here, which says "New Metal 2.0 is here." <laughs> just Whoa. what we ordered. Thank you. <laughs> I am most definitely not cl clicking that link. So thank you. <laughs> uh, by the way, like for this year's Eurovision contest, we Finland actually sent a new metal band, <laughs> and then they did well. They were sixth on the whole competition. That's good. That is what good. I loved about, but by, by the way, what I loved about those guys was that they didn't want to win because no Eurovision ever winner ever does great after the show. Like they might have five seconds of fame and then it's usually like a huge drop. Where some artists who have been like fourth, or fifth, sixth, or some of that place have like have been able to establish like proper careers. So Eurovision knowledge to you all. It's most the most ridiculous, and that's why it's all like a thing on TV, and that's why it's also very entertaining. Uh, but jumping to the next thing on guitar.com, five pieces of iconic gear that were lost and are still missing today. And the subhead mm. I know that I now know to call as a subhead says, "We will, will we ever solve the mystery of these lost?" Parts of rock and roll history, maybe we can help you find them. Unlikely, I would say. There's no yes, uh, gotta reply with my shirt. Unlikely. And, and the first item is the missing cloud guitar. So Prince had a custom builder. Uh, there was a builder called Dave Rusana who built uh, Prince his first. Cloud guitar, you can here on YouTube. You can see that guitar. Uh, it's very iconic, very weird. And Prince liked the guitar so much that he asked the builder to build two more of those as well for his Purple Rain tour. And those three guitars stuck with Prince for years. And unfortunately, Prince had had also the affinity to throw his guitars uh, to his techs, and they weren't always caught. <laughs> so they would be a little bit repaired and repainted a lot over the years. And to add to, her, to the confusion, Prince also had other builder, builders build him more of these guitars as well. And one of the three, or, three original guitars built for him, just uh, one of them is in Smithsonian Museum, and it's painted yellow now. One was sold at auction in 2020 for nice 563000 uh, dollars. Uh, which and that guitar is painted blue, but there was the third original one, which is just missing. And apparently, like, I think with all of these articles, or like most of these articles, uh, like the instrument is missing, but the people, but like the owners of these instruments, at some point have been contacted by someone that they have the instrument. Like somebody just says, Hey, uh, I got your guitar, you gonna get it? It's going to cost you a lot of money. And <laughs> those haven't been 
retrieved. So <laughs> that's the common theme with these articles. Uh, uh, yeah. Just, these are interesting stories like how the instruments were lost or how they went missing. And uh, the second item is the Bino Burst, which is a, like a 1960 Les Paul standard owned by Eric Clapton. Uh, that he used to record blues breakers with Eric Clapton. And yeah, the guitar is commonly referred as Bino because the guitarist could be seen reading a copy of the storied British comic magazine on the cover. And uh, yeah, with this guitar. I read that when I was a kid, the Bino every week. Yeah. Yeah, this was a yeah. very iconic instrument. I didn't know it was lost, to be honest. Yeah. I'm not that bothered about it but it seems like it was stolen from a from a cream gig in 1966 and since then it's been missing you know it's it's someone probably owns it and has no idea what they have or possibly someone could be by the knows way. exactly yeah, what they've that, got but we don't know yeah <laughs> but yeah the whereabouts of the guitar remain unknown uh oh yeah uh Oh, wait, the there's more. Bino. Joe Bonamassa there's is more. involved. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Aha. Uh, Joe so, Bo- he, ha, ha. he claims that he knows Boom. the whereabouts of the iconic axe when he did an interview with Guitarist <laughs> magazine in 2016, claiming, it's in a collection on the East Coast of America. That's all I can tell you, and that's all I will say. <laughs> then Joe Bonamassa returned to his second home on the East Coast of America and refused oh, to answer any more telephone calls. <laughs> And he claims that it's a 1959 Les Paul, not a 1960. And yeah, of course, that's why he's after it, because it's a 59 model. But yeah, interesting. Obviously, Bonamassa is one of the most famous collectors of old Gibson guitars. And I'm sure lots of people call him up and say, I've got this and this. Do you want to buy it? And yeah, when it comes to, you know, being an accessory to stolen gear, to contraband or whatever you want to call it, that's a, that's a tricky situation. I'm guessing he was offered to buy it and probably yeah. turned it down because it was stolen and he knew that <laughs> or maybe not yeah I love the fact that as soon as we're talking about like a le- all Les Paul somehow Joe Bonamassa is involved just right Bonamassa away I think you can just yeah. assume that he's involved he probably has like a Excel sheet somewhere on his computer or on his phone where he just like he just knows the whereabouts of every single 59 Les Paul in the world I wouldn't su- be surprised if that's actually true yeah, it's like when when we were kids, we would all collect football stickers, right? There were these little little cards about this big and they had the head of a football player from the top division and you would swap them with friends. And <laughs> everyone would have a little collection of stickers that they had, like duplicates of ones that they already had in their own manuals. And you'd swipe through them with people like a pack of cards and you'd say, got, 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 need when you saw one that you didn't have, and I bet that's how Bonamassa yeah. is. He's got a little set of <laughs> 1959 Les Paul trading cards, and he sits at home sometimes and goes through them and goes, got, 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 need, got, got, got. So, yeah, yeah, he's a lucky man. He, he owns probably more 59 Les Pauls than anyone else in the world, I would guess. Yeah. He's got a bunch yeah, of them. Why not, the cool why, thing about him is that he hobbies. tours them as well. Yeah. One of these hub- hobbies is a bit more expensive than the other. <laughs> The football stickers, or in my case, hockey ice hockey cards. Ice hockey cards, Fnumis yeah. Paul's. <laughs> yeah, Bonamassa's hobby is a bit more expensive than ours, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, the third item on the list, third, I think it was the third. Yeah. Uh, Paul McCartney's Hofner 501, oh, how do you, dash one violin bass, mm-hmm. uh, which I think I just saw. I've been watching the Beatles thing on Disney Plus. Haven't finished it yet, but this it, this one, I think. Uh, yeah, he bought it in 1961 and he landed on Hofner because it was cheap compared to more iconic fenders of the era. Um, because Paul McCartney plays left-handed, the, the symmetrical body was easier for him to handle. And I'm trying to feel like, trying to check how, was, I forgot how it was lost. It was lost during the 1969 Let It Be sessions. So that's oh. around the time of the the film that everyone's watching right now. So he had this bass originally and he bought another one in 1963. And then this one, the lost one, was uh, 
used as a backup, and it was lost during 1969, vanished, never to be seen again. Presumed stolen out of a closet in the studio. So there you go. Oh, the man. guitar is, as they say, perhaps the most valuable instrument on the planet, being his first bass and having a recorded legacy unlike any other instrument. It's possibly yeah. true. I mean, I would be surprised if the most expensive, you know, guitar or bass in the world would be a bass, but it's Paul McCartney's bass, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, I bet a bunch but, of guitarists would be disappointed that it's a bass, but... Yeah, and of yeah. course, the bottom paragraph, uh, a guy who did a biography of Paul McCartney yeah. in 2016 claims that he's communicated via email with a person who calls himself <laughs> the Keeper, who claims to have the original Hofner bass. The Keeper claims he is not the thief and seemed open to the idea of returning the bass to McCartney, although probably not for free. The years that have passed have not resulted in any further action on the matter, not publicly anyway. And I noticed that Joe Bonamassa hasn't commented on this one at all, but is he the keeper? I would guess not. Uh, well, you never know. You never know. Maybe he is. <laughs> the keeper. Uh, the, the other one who, who like holds guitars is uh, Ingvi. So it's one of those. Maybe Ingvi emailed Paul McCartney. Hey, I got this. I got the thing. Needs but another Ferrari. Five Stratocasters. Yeah. <laughs> I am the keeper. That is mysterious, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I'm the keeper. Of <laughs> seven, seven keys or whatever the Iron Maiden album is. So, yeah. Uh, next item is the Trainwreck Amplifier Ginger. And yeah, Trainwreck Wreck Amps is this uh, pretty legendary like almost dumbbell level sort of thing where there hasn't been like that many amps produced and apparently they're very like dynamic and fuzzy and everything and very heavily copied as well by other brands design wise and again I'm trying to remember how this was lost I should have reread the article from yesterday <laughs> yeah some of some of the his amps uh are being sold at like sixty thousand dollars on the used market. So, the price of a very nice car or half the house, depending on yeah, where you it, live. It won't be too long before they get up to you know a hundred thousand dollars and and oh, dumble sort of prices. But yeah, if we go down again to the last paragraph of this article too, we can see that the yeah. amp was built for a musician named Casper McLeod and was named Ginger after Casper's wife. Um, and according to John Mark, who hand builds the train wreck camps today, someone contacted him somewhat recently, claiming to be the current owner of Ginger. <laughs> but the emails stopped and the amp faded back into the ether. So there you go. The keeper of Ginger either had a spam filter that didn't let the emails get through or decided not to, not to sell the amp back. Yeah. <laughs> These are such weird stories like amps disappearing and like, I got your amp. I have your base. And then Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's it's like what compels them to tell the people that they have them? Yeah, that's like, the thing. Like, do you think they need money? Because they obviously know if they have something stolen or they bought something that's been stolen, yeah. it should go back to its rightful owner. But I don't know. Very strange. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, the last item is James Hetfield's Kill Em All Marshall. And yeah, uh, it was a Marshall amp that was used to recall, they used to record Metallica's debut album, Kill Em All. And yeah, he used a Marshall Master Volume amp, uh, which was modified by a mod guru, Jose Arredondo. Sorry if I'm butchering his name. And uh, that was the guy who also did mods for Eddie and Halen and Steve Vai back in the 70s and 80s. And Kirk Hammett, Hammett used the amp for all his leads on that album as well. The amp was stolen along with a bunch of other gear, including Kirk's amp and last drums on four, January 14th, 1984 at a gig in Boston. And I'm uh, trying to check like whether they have been anonymously contacted by someone. Because <laughs> I just assumed that's going to happen. 
Yeah. No. James it, it, it says that he was. Yeah. Yeah. James says that it was. Uh, he said, "I'm. I'm sure I wasn't really thinking about killing myself, but it was one, my favorite martial amp, man. That's how he commented. The amp was wow. never recovered. Fortune. Yeah. <laughs> the article says, fortunately, Metallica were able to carry on and make some pretty good music afterwards." <laughs> Thanks, guitar.com. <laughs> Luckily for them. I, I wouldn't have Luckily known if the article them. hadn't told me. And yeah, the yeah. loss of the amp sent Metallica on a career-long tone quest. Brands like Meza, Dietzel, Crank, Wizard, and Roland litter the sonic, san sonic landscape of Metallica's discography. And these days, <laughs> they're using fractal axe effects units for their live sound. So that's a tone quest that's come full circle. And who knows, maybe true. one day, Hetfield will be sitting at home strumming away, working on his right-hand technique when his phone will ring. And yeah. he'll pick up and say, hey, it's James here, man. And someone will say, <laughs> James, it's the keeper. I have your amp. And we'll get another article in a couple of years' time. But this was actually yeah. a fascinating read. I think most yeah. people prefer to think or read more about lost instruments that got found again, like you know Peter Frampton's Les Paul, for example. But yeah. this is an interesting article. It, Sometimes I do wonder about when I go into music stores that sell second-hand gear, how many cool stories there must be behind some of the instruments. And sometimes you just never know. Yeah, definitely. Fun read. If you want to go into more details, there's obviously links to all everything we mentioned here in the show notes. So be sure to check them out. But yeah, these were fun, weird stories. And yeah, I'm trying to get into the headspace of someone who has possibly stolen the amp or is in is in possession of an amp or guitar that they know is very valuable but they're like hey I got it and then when you give it oh cool can you sell it back to me and then you don't hear anything from them <laughs> <laughs> feels just very random <clears throat> yeah it's a strange thing because if you have a stolen amp like that which is a legendary thing it's like you know occasionally a, a masterpiece from the art world gets stolen for example, yeah. the scream. One of the screams was stolen at some point. And you just wonder, how would someone ever sell one of those things? How would yeah. you sell one of these iconic things? How would you sell Paul McCartney's bass? I mean, you would have to sell it to someone who was also prepared to look over the fact that they were buying stolen merchandise, I guess. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's an interesting story. Perhaps yeah. one day we'll find out more. You know, if the keeper needs money, for example. I, I kind of assume that that's why these guys sort of reach out because they realize they yeah. have something which could be a payday for them, and then kind of, yeah, they say, yeah, I'd be prepared to sell it for this price, and if the artist then says yes, you know, maybe they get cold feet and just sort of disappear, because they realize if they come out to sell the guitar, you know, they might get turned into the authorities or something. Yeah, that's the thing. Or uh, ask how they yeah, got it, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, jumping into the next thing, best Christmas and holiday gifts for guitarists in 2021. Looking to bring some cheer to the guitarist in your life? This holiday season, question mark. And let's just dive into the list. For the beginning, beginner, Epiphone inspired by Gibson Les Paul special. Uh, is this a good beginning guitar? What do you think? Well, I mean, if, if I was a beginner and I got that guitar, you know, it's 10 times the quality of any of the beginner instruments that I ever played, but... I would probably not give a guitar playing beginner a guitar with P90s. Yes. I'd give him something uh, a bit more say. standard. Yeah, it, that is true. It's it's quite a niche instrument, let's put it that way as well. It's it's not the kind of instrument that inspires most people to pick up the guitar, I don't think, but for some people it would. Yeah. Yeah, I would like, if I would get someone a beginning guitar, I would first try to find out like what kind of music they're into. Because I think if the instrument inspires that kid or an adult uh, to play more, just because it looks like something uh, like the guitar player of his or her favorite band plays, so that would make more sense. I mean, it's it's probably a fine instrument, but an interesting choice. I'm gonna say. yeah, exactly. And I mean, these Epiphone inspired by Gibson guitars are really high quality you know for a beginner's yeah. instrument as well that is very pricey 
if you're thinking about more traditional beginner's choices, like a, you know, a Squire oh, Affinity, Tele or Strat or whatever, this is probably three or four times the price of one of those. Uh, maybe two or three, but yeah. Yeah. $450 is quite a lot, actually. For that money, you can get there's so many options. For us in Europe, you can get like a premium Harley Benton for that. Yeah, but I think what you said, the, the perfect beginner's guitar is the guitar that inspires that beginner to continue playing and get better and enjoy what yeah. they're doing. So there you go. Yeah, if this is yeah. the guitar, then it's the perfect choice. If not, then it's not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for the intermediate player, <laughs> inter intermediate player, Fender pl player plus Stratocaster. That was a difficult sentence for me to pronounce. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so this is part of the new range. It's $1,000 or so. These are like a very well-specced guitars. Some have like wide range humbuckers and stuff like that. But this, they're specifically going for like a traditional Strat. Uh, again, depends on what you're actually playing. And for a Christmas gift, like $1,000 is quite a lot already. Yeah, that is... I'm not sure I've ever received a Christmas gift that's anywhere near a thousand dollars in terms of value. But <laughs> yep. you know, if you had, let's say, a rich relative who was giving out presents to people that were about a thousand dollars, and they didn't know anything about music, if they were to go for a Player Plus Strat, I think most people would be happy, right? Because oh yes, at the end of the day, Strats are classics and can do pretty much everything. If my rich relative with no idea was able to get an HSS version of this guitar, I would be over the moon because you can do everything with that instrument. Yeah. It is an interesting choice, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you, I'm just going to say it. You could all, like always sell this and get the guitar you want. You could also do that, yes. <laughs> so... In any case, if you are buying this for someone, you're probably going to make them happy. Because they either get a guitar that they wanted to have, or they're getting a guitar they can sell and get the gear they want. So it's a win-win situation in my eyes, at least. So. This, yeah, th this is a really interesting article. Who is this article yeah. for? Because it's on guitar.com. So is it written for the guitar-playing readers of the magazine? If so, it's I guess so. It's kind of a weird list. And if not, if it's just been written, you know, to get random people who are searching for guitar gifts for guitar playing members of their families or whatever, it's also like it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like it, but it, it's just, you know, one choice in each category and just <laughs> Yeah. You know. Uh guitar uh, players are, guitar are all individuals, you know. Yeah, but let's true. see what's next. Yeah, the next one is the premium price guitar, and the title says, "If money is an object, Gretsch as G six one six twelve nine T eighty nine vintage select eighty nine Sparkle Jet." That's a nice name. Uh, very retro, very niche as well. Well, if you got Extremely the money, why not? But yeah, I mean, what, what's the price on this one? If it's kind of uh, budget, not an issue? $2,800. Yeah, I mean, for $2,800, you can get anything you want. Yes. So it's much. like, if, if this is exactly what you want, perfect. Imagine if you yes. were a rich guitar player and the one thing you wanted was this guitar and you got it for Christmas. That would be amazing now, wouldn't it? But I don't know. Yes. I, this, this is a... <laughs> An interesting read, this list. Yes, it's it's more for entertainment purposes. Uh, next one is for the tuba amp fan, Fem, Fender Vibro Champ Reverb. Okay, maybe. But why the Vibro Champ and then, let's say, like a, I don't know, Deluxe Reverb? <clears throat> I think probably one of the key issues here is the fact that it's five watts and they're saying you can play it at uh, home. Uh, I'm okay, not sure. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, of course, you're not going to want to really gig with it. But you could. You mic it up, of course. But this is, according to the article, 
more for more for home players. I believe that a five watt Fender amp is probably way too loud to play at home, an old yes. tube Fender amp anyway. But um, yeah, another cool amp. But why this one? It's, it seems like an arbitrary yeah. choice. It does. Just a but. bit random. I, I'm kind of enjoying this list anyway. It's, it's yeah, very random. It, I'm having a, a fun time, but it's it's also a mysterious list. <laughs> yeah, especially because the four, the next one, the next item is for the acoustic player, Yamaha THR thirty. Is that Mark two A? So that's is that the acoustic guitar version of the amp? I think it is. Right? <laughs> you better hope so. For if it's for <laughs> acoustic <laughs> players. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is the first one where it feels like we're sort of in a, a budget range and we're sort of with an item which is kind of mass market acceptance. And if you got one of these, you'd yeah. be like, oh, that's cool. It looks great. They sound really good. I know what they can do. You know, the Yamaha THR amps are a classic and, and so many players have yeah. got them and had them as Christmas presents. What do these cost now, these Mark II ones? Are they like 400 Whoa. euros or something maybe? Six, $600. Oh, okay, more than so more expensive than I thought as well, but still, yeah. that's a really cool gift. Yeah, and, can, and you can use it as an audio interface as well. So you that's, can. Well, that's, that's like an all, all in one like acoustic guitar recording package. So yeah, that's actually exactly, kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. I approve this choice. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. Reason. I approve them all, uh, but this one more than the others. Okay. Mm. This one, uh, for the amplifier obsessed. Neural DSP quad cortex. Uh, is this the thing you would get? Like, if somebody is amp obsessed, <laughs> would this be the thing you would get for them? Let's say, even if you had like an unlimited budget. <laughs> That's what guitar.com would get. <laughs> yes, so it seems. It's almost $1,900, by the way. For that money, like, for the amplifier obsessed. And you have nineteen hundred dollars to spend. You can get almost any like an amp amp instead of this one. I guess I get yeah. what the point they're going for, but what? <laughs> well, wait. Let's let's read the article a little bit and see if we can see the point that they're going for. Because I still don't get it. <laughs> I read it and I still don't get it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's they say that the tones are organic, feeling, responsive, and overall a joy to play. And he, here played back and comes with the boom of in the ease of home recording. Sure. It's great for studio, for home use and stage and all of that. And provided there's a good PA and monitoring uh, quarter, Cortex can easily place your stage amplifier and pedal board. Uh, yeah. So it's, I, I just it's don't the think perfect that, for the amp obsessed person. You know, if you're obsessed yeah. with amps, Happy Christmas, here's an amp type product that isn't actually an amp that you can use to yeah. replace all your other amps that you love so much and you never need to have yes. them anymore. So you can sell them and do something with that yeah. money instead. I don't know. This, this is a mysterious one. This and is a mysterious again, one. You've got to have very deep pockets to be giving one of these away as a Christmas present. That's true. Also, uh, you've got to hope that they're available. Can you even buy them in shops easily? Or are they still sort I of think... pretty limited? I think they've managed to sort out most of the like availability issues. I believe. I, I think it's available at Thoman right away if you want to get one. Pretty sure yeah. of that. Uh, for the home producer, Blackstar Depth Ten Dual Drive. What is this? What? Because <laughs> that's what every home <laughs> studio needs. It's a, yes, it's a distortion a pedal channel. by Blackstar. Yes, a tube distortion pedal. Not yeah, I mean, we, we well. do have to say that these do have recording options. They have a DI, don't they? And they have um, cab sin stuff in them. Oh, that's a true. A collection of over 250 virtual cabinet tones are available in there. So you can connect it and go straight into your recording software. But if you're a home producer mm. and making your own beats or whatever, and you get one of these given to you, it's, you'd be mystified. <laughs> It's a, it's a little bit confusing, especially like it, it's uh, $299. For that money, you could get like a Focusrite Scarlet and like two neural DSP plugins. Uh, let's say you would get like a Gojira one and maybe like um, 
Corey Wong ones that have all the range of clean tones and all the range of like different drive tones and an audio interface without the same money. <laughs> Instead of getting the Blackstar Depth and Dual Drive, I've I've heard of it, but I've never heard anyone play that. Just saying, this is a is, is there like guitar.com is a British magazine? Is there like maybe a slight uh, England uh, bias here? I'm just saying, throwing it out there. <laughs> maybe with this one specific one, there is. <laughs> yeah, uh, the other ones, other ones don't feel like that. Uh, I don't think so, though. But um, yeah, they do have one line here which I think is interesting, where they say um, this doesn't have the same processing power as something like the Quad Cortex. Of course, it doesn't, but the simplicity of it may appeal to certain guitar players. I kind of understand yeah. that. If you literally want to yeah. plug your guitar in and get a nice drive tone out of it, then you could just go from this straight into your computer and, and that would do the job. But I feel like this use of that pedal is not the main use for it, you know? Yeah. These are pretty new, these Black Star uh, Depth 10, or however you pronounce it, Department 10. And I haven't really seen that much about them online yet. I haven't really watched any of the YouTube videos on them. I'm excited to check them out and see what they do, but I feel like the recording feature should either be the main focus or they should not bother with it so yeah. much. I don't know. Perhaps I'll change yeah. my mind when I try one, but still, this is <laughs> this is an interesting thing. I mean, the the fact that there's, it's a tube-powered overdrive pedal in, it, in and of itself is, for me, a pretty cool thing. So, So that would be worth looking at. What do yeah. they cost, by the way? Two ninety nine hundred dollars. So that that's what I was yeah. saying. Like you get an, you could get an audio interface and two super high quality neutral DSP plugins, and still actually yeah. probably save some money. Yeah. But yes, I think the point you brought up, brought up was good. Like this is, I, I actually don't feel like this is simple enough because there's like an ISF control with this one. There's two different like. I don't know, I'm guessing clipping circuits and stuff like that. It's still like semi-complicated for drive pedal, but yeah. Interesting choice. For the ambient player, Universal Audio Starlight, which is an echo station. Maybe? Yes. I'm not too well-versed in the, in the Universal Audio pedals, but apparently they sound great. No, I haven't used them either, but they are supposed to be really, really good, but also considering the price, fairly limited. I mean, if you want to make ambient noises, I'm sure the Starlight is <coughs> fantastic. <laughs> but again, a lot of people would just go for the the digital plugins, wouldn't they, to get these yeah. kinds of sounds? And Am I right in saying that these UA pedals are not stereo? Uh, I am not. 100% sure, but I was just thinking for the $400, you could also get a used Strymon Big Sky, which is stereo and is like an industry standard. Or you could get, uh, I'm forgetting what's the name of the uh, first of all company. Like they have this, you could get, they also do. I know what you're talking about. You could get the Source Audio Collider, which is yes, exactly. basically their big box delay and reverb for. I think they're about 350 euros right now. Yeah. So used, cheaper, and they're fantastic. Yeah. Again, I haven't I haven't used the UA Starlight, but Collider is good. There are better value options out there. If you absolutely love their tones, then you'll want to go for this. Yeah. I just want to check if it's stereo or not because I seem yeah. to remember right. that was part of the debate when they came out. Yeah. Uh, while we do that, I'm actually going to scroll to the next one. For the, the for distortion fans, Walrus Audio Eras, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really great sounding distortion based on all of the demos I've seen. So yes, yeah, sure, it, it's, why not? It's a unique sounding one as well. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Uh, I okay, don't have that much the, to say about Yeah, go ahead. The UA Starlight is stereo. I just okay tripped. makes sense. Well, so that's good at least. But yeah, so the Eras is a very interesting overdrive pedal, and it sounds very different to a lot of other overdrives out there. It has a yeah. bunch of different modes, and you can get standard overdrive distortion sounds. It's quite medium to high gain, I think. Yeah. 
and it does some sounds which are, are just really unique. I mean, <laughs> to anyone watching this, it, it's too hard to kind of describe how they sound. So go and have a watch of some of the videos that are out there, and you can yeah. hear how it how it reacts to different kind of players and playing. But an interesting pedal, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay with that choice. Uh, for the pedal board, obsessed the Stormbox book. Yeah, yeah, looks like a great book. Sure, coffee table thing for for pedal nerds. Yeah, that's that kind of thing is always a a nice gift idea, I think. Yeah, definitely. It's fun to look at. Oh, I'm just gonna scroll to the next one <laughs> for the, for the power hungry, uh, Ernieball Volt power supply. Okay. Why not? Yeah. Not a glamorous present, but everyone needs pedal power. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to scroll past this one because I want to talk about the next <laughs> one, which is <laughs> for the dangerously pedal board obsessed, the Schmidt Array board. And yes, I definitely agree in that. Like, one of these days, I would love to be able to get one of the Schmidt Array boards, which, by the way, by themselves uh, cost like hundreds and hundreds of euros already. And then you get you have to get the pedals and everything else on top of that. Yeah, exactly. But, they don't come they look chock full super, with nice pedals. Yeah, they look super practical though. I guess my problem would be that my pedal boards never stay intact for too long. I always end up sw swapping something and yeah, I don't know if the the it makes sense for me to get one. So Yeah, I, you I never think know. like they say in their little subtitle there, you have to be dangerously pedalboard obsessed <laughs> yes, to have a board like this. <laughs> and you also have to have a dangerously high level of disposable income because, as yeah. you've mentioned, Vlad, the, these are premium luxury pedal boards. They're amazing yep. things, but again, only for people who... I would say also they're only really... Well, they're only super useful for people who are actually kind of touring professionals who, who need that kind of device. Of course, yep. you know, people with hobbies and money... Can, can go for them as well, but this is a Touring sure. Pro's pedal board solution. Probably amazing, but again, as, as a present, would you buy one of these for someone if if you didn't know that they wanted or needed something like this? If I knew that they were needed and wanted something like this, I would get, but otherwise, no. <laughs> this is a very random gift in a yeah, way. It's weird because like, the Schmidt arrays, they're very sort of specific in terms of their sizing and stuff as well, aren't they? So, yeah. I would really worry, even if like you gave me money and said, buy me a Schmidt Array board, I know you, I know what pedals you generally use, I wouldn't want to make that choice. I would want to let you buy it because you know exactly what you would want. And I suppose that applies yeah. to the rest of the presents on this list. But there you go. Yeah. Uh, for the vintage nerd, we can buck guitars out of the frying pan into the... Ferreglo Deluxe Edition, a book about guitars, basically. Again, yep, another coffee cool. table book, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Nice picks. Why not? Yes, exactly. Uh, More people should read somewhere. books on paper. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to get this book, uh, don't get the Kindle edition for your guitar playing family member or friend. Get them the real book, because no one wants to see a book like that in the Kindle format. Yeah. In fact, I hope that book is not available in Kindle format because you would lose all of the all of the magic. It's about looking at the images, isn't it? <laughs> yep, that's true. And uh, for the living room audio pro. By the way, look at the look at the price of the yep. book. What? What? List for one hundred seventy five pounds. What? Why? <laughs> Why? It's a premium book. Well, yeah, but what? that's absolutely crazy. It makes no sense. It's for the Rickenbacker super fans, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, so it seems, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, for the living room, Audio Pro Drumfire Black Star Edition, this is like a home speaker system for how much? 7,000 kronos? Uh, what? 7,000 so kronos. Sw Swedish, Swedish currency, I think. Weird. Uh, yeah, I guess if you got the money, why not? 
And I think the last item is also very confusing. It is the last item. <laughs> it is. Uh, for the audio file, Fender turntable. <laughs> In sunburst. Okay. Beautiful. In sunburst. Which is also uh, $3,500. Wow. <laughs> that is one expensive turntable, I might add. You know what someone so, needs to do? They need to get this sunburst Fender record player and they need to search out a pair of those Gibson Flame Maple monitor speakers, put them together, yeah. put a record on and just wallow in the disgustingness of, of these novelty products. <laughs> yep, totally agree. All right, technical issue solved. We're going back to albums of our lives next. Like plastic on a CD shelf, these are the albums of our lives. Yeah, it's time for Rich's album pick, a title that I forgot on top of the intro, but never mind that. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have for us? I have a very special record, and I've gone back to one of my very favorites, and it's a record that's 20 years old this year, so I'm showing my age. This record came out when I was a teenager. It came out in the, well, it was like a staggered release over 2001 because that's when, you know, when bands did like world promotional tours and they would release a record in America or Australia and then they'd be in another country and it would get released then. But this record is probably one of the top five of my personal favorite records in my lifetime so far, and it is going to get raised slowly into the picture right now. It is... Ooh. Is This It by The Strokes? Are you familiar with that <laughs> album, Vlad? Uh, I know the album cover, but... It's a bit of a naughty album cover, actually, for our family-friendly <laughs> show. Actually, the American true. edition of this album had a different cover, because this one, it's a, it's a person's side with a, with a glove on. Which kind of reminds me of Spinal Tap's legendary <laughs> Smell the Glove album. But I, I yeah, in America more, it was replaced. Yeah, I think I'm okay with sharing the Wikipedia article for this. There's a US cover as well <laughs> that's available over here. Yeah, there's the American Forest one. That, um, that design, that nice pattern there, yeah. which is some kind of scientific um, reaction going on. I, I remember reading yeah. about it. But yeah, so The Strokes, is this it? This is their first album... And they called it, is this it, without a question mark, because they said the question mark looked wrong. But yeah, this record came out when I was 17 or 18, whatever time of the year it came out. And um, I'd been getting progressively more and more excited about The Strokes for some time, because back in the day, you would read magazines to get your music news, right? When I was 16, yeah. 17, I was reading Kerrang! for my heavier metal needs and Metal Hammer as well. And I was also reading stuff like the NME to get more of my indie news fix. And the strokes were getting pushed more and more in the NME. They were going to be seen as this next big thing. And they turned out to be the next big thing. And they inspired a generation of indie bands after that. And they also inspired kind of a massive boom in the bands. You know, there were so many indie bands called The Something or Other that came out right after <laughs> the strokes and had some flash in the pan success. But the strokes were the biggest ones. And anyway, the noises started to come out that their first album was going to be great, and they released an EP called The Modern Age. And I remember at the time using our old dial telephone to ring round record shops <laughs> in England to try and get a copy of The Modern Age EP on CD because it was super limited and it was selling out everywhere super fast. And I got one, and I think it's worth quite a bit of money these days. But I got this four-track EP, played it to death, absolutely loved it. And then I got to see them at the Reading Festival as well. And they were one of the rare bands who were pushed from a, a smaller stage up to the big stage. And an amazing live band. And their first and best record for me is Is This It, their first one. It came out in Europe and America in, I think, around September 2001. I actually think in America it was released on September 11th. So on that terrible date in oh history. Boy. But this record wow. itself is actually... Toxicity by System of a Down was released on the same day. I seem to remember oh, as well. True. They're both September the 11th albums. So, yeah, they go down in history for that terrible reason. But Is This It by The Strokes is such an influential and great record for me. It defined how I thought about music back in the day. 
And the Strokes themselves were such cool guys. They sort of defined how I approached the world as a young man, if you know what I mean. They changed the way I, yeah. I dressed, the way I wore my hair, the way I thought about playing guitar. Just look at the picture from the back of the record. I don't know if you can actually see that, if that's in focus or anything. But like, oh, that's these cool. were these were some of the coolest guys that I'd ever seen back in the day. And, you know, they dressed like they'd bought cheap suits from a, a 70s thrift store. They wore Converse. They had unkempt curly hair, most of them. They were just super cool. <laughs> it was a kind of a band that I thought I could sort of be in, but the super uncool English version of that band, who was also a little bit overweight. But you know what I mean? They were, they, they were these super cool guys, and they came out with a record which is kind of like, it's, hard to describe it's indie rock it's poppy in a way but it's extremely melodic and the songs are all fantastic all of the songs are written by julian casablancas who is the main vocalist and as a guitar player i think what really inspires me is the fact that there's always two guitars doing amazing sort of interplays and doing things yeah. to kind of work against one another so one of the guitar players is a guy called albert hammond jr he's the guy with the with the big curly hair and he would play a strat normally on the middle pickup and he would play most of the rhythm. He'd be playing bar chords, lots of downstrokes. And Nick Valencia was the other guitar player. And he had a really cool Epiphone Riviera, like a 90s model mm. with Gibson P94 pickups. A super cool guitar. And he would do more of the lead stuff and more of the melodies. And they just had this amazing kind of sense of linking the, the parts between them and coming up with guitar parts that were busy, that did stuff, but also complemented themselves and complemented the songs. There were only solos when they needed to have solos. They were amazing musicians too, and a great live band as well. And I was influenced by them so much. I listened back to this album a few times again over the past week and just realized that so much of the stuff that I play now is influenced by these guys. The most famous song on the record is Last Night, which I think most people will know. It's, it became quite a big hit, but there are so many good ones on the album. You know, I'm not going to list all the songs, but there's 11 on there, and they're all... Fantastic. My personal favorite yep. is probably, eh, it's hard to pick a favorite, Barely Legal, <laughs> Soma, maybe New York City Cops. There are so many good songs on this record, but it's a record that if you listen to Cat Pick Fridays and you've listened to our favorite choices from the past few weeks, you'll totally get why I've chosen it. You'll totally get why it fits in with me. I think it's a record that you, Vlad, will probably not like as much. It's perhaps not so much your thing, but give it a try and see what you think. One thing that will definitely interest you is how it was recorded because they went down into a basement in New York to do it with a guy who was a, a competent producer. I think Gordon Raphael was his name and he had Pro Tools back then. So it was done on Pro Tools, but they recorded most of it live. They only oh, had like nice. three mics on the drums, for example. So you, you can hear bleed from the guitar amps going into it. And the singer, Julian Casablanca, has recorded all the vocals through a cheap PV sort of preamp to get a bit of distortion going on and a bit of compression. It's just a super unique sounding record and it changed the way that indie music was back then. And now it's 20 years old. I listened to it last night for the most recent <laughs> time and it still sounds as fresh as it did when I heard it the first time. So it's Is This It by The Strokes, one of my favorite records ever, and you should all listen to it. Oh, yes. I'm pretty sure I'm familiar with some of the songs from the album because it sounds familiar. I I have heard, <coughs> excuse me, the strokes. Uh, yeah, getting ready to listen and see how many songs I actually know from it because it's very likely that I know some of them at least. Because you'll probably I, recognize some of them, like from you know adverts or movies and stuff, yeah, because a lot of it is very sort of friendly to that kind of medium. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always love the idea of going to a studio and recording stuff live. That's, I don't know, that speaks to me. It It's really cool. When you do, like, you can add overdubs later and stuff like that, but like if the core of the song is recorded live, that's just awesome every single time. Yeah, I remember yeah, that uh, reading about the album, none of the songs has more than 11 tracks in Pro Tools. So it was all pared down, kept nice and simple. It's a great album. I love it. Yep, yep. two thumbs up. Yes, two thumbs up for me as well. I approve your choice. Yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to give a quick two thumbs up to Mike from CGS, I guess from yes. last week. He yeah. recommended a record by Gin Blossoms for us to listen mm. to called Congratulations, I'm Sorry. Let me just double check that. Yeah, I think that was the record yeah, he recommended. 
I went and listened to it. It's a very cool listen. You know, yeah. if, if you like indie rock, well. if you like stuff like The Strokes, you'll you'll probably dig that as well. So, well done, yep. Mike. Great choice. Thumbs up again. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to give this an album a listen as well. And as you mentioned, it was last week or whenever it was, like, I've been listening more uh, more music because of this segment of the show, like, and finding new artists and bands. And I need to get myself more familiar with the Strokes because they, I, I know that they are, like, one of the big bands in that genre, at least. So, yeah, definitely going to give it a listen. And what we're definitely going to do next as well is and some of your <clears throat> oh come on my voice is running out we'll we'll power through some of your questions and comments next questions and comments all right let's see if this actually works uh, almost works there you go there you go yeah the first question comes from our friend uh, Louis. Vasquez and he asks or comments on the previous episode and <clears throat> mentions that he really needs to see that V100 in action. Uh, was that the Harley Benton? No, nope, it was the vintage. No. Oh, that's true. Yes, please excuse me. And we're actually going to do a thing here where we are combining weekend watch with this segment because check this out. Kaboom! Um, just click the wrong button, but close. Yeah, Rich actually has a demo. Like, as you watch this show, this video should be out by that time as well. And Rich is demoing a vintage reshoot V100 in wine red. So, yeah, mini humbuckers. Are they cool? Are they not cool? Uh, Rich, you know more about them than I do. I do. And the very quick answer is, yes, they're cool. They're super cool. <laughs> I think, you know, not enough people use mini humbuckers. And they're sort of an unloved pickup in a way. It's like yeah. you hardly ever see them, especially on standard guitars. I talked about it a bit last week when we, when we showed this guitar just a little bit. And you realize that the vintage V100 in wine red is pretty much the only sort of standard affordable guitar out there these days with mini humbuckers in it. You can get Firebirds, sure, but they're slightly different to standard mini humbuckers. And there are some other kind of more niche instruments that have it, but the vintage is sort of out there on its own in offering it. And yeah. the mini humbuckers, if you were to go through and watch my video, you'll hear that they are kind of, they're somewhere between single coils and full-sized humbuckers. And they sort of have all the good bits of the other pickups and they don't have the bad bits like... You know, they're not noisy like a single coil is when you turn up the gain. And they're not kind of flubby or sort of imprecise like a humbucker can be. They don't get as muddy. Yeah, by the yeah. same token, they're not as big and fat sounding as some full-size humbuckers for metal or whatever. And they're not quite as twangy as a true single coil on a telly, for example. But they they have their own thing and they sound great. I really like them. And yeah, just to go into what Lewis says a bit, he says the guitar is beautiful. Agreed. <laughs> and Lewis also says they might not be great on their own, but in a dense metal rock, hard rock mix with pianos, violins, and a bunch of background vocals, they really poke out. Um, yeah. Lewis says there's a limit on how fat something can be in a mix, and a lot of the fatness that humbuckers have kind of gets removed with the EQ to control the muddiness. He feels they need to work less to fit into a mix than mini humbuckers, but maybe that's just my experience. I would have to agree totally with what Lewis says there. I'm, I've kind of just sort of said that in a way. I've not put this vintage <laughs> V100 into a mix yet, but I just know that it's going to sit in there in a nicer way than a humbucker would. You know, It yep. occupies that sort of sonic frequency, which is between the other guitar pickups and will sit really well in, in a mix. So I reckon you, Lewis, you need to try out a guitar with mini humbuckers and see how it works for you. Yeah, it just sounds like that to me as well. And I'm very interested in mini humbuckers thanks to this conversation as well because uh, one of the things I've done every now and then is to like double the riff I'm playing with a telly because it has that same pokiness. But if I can get like a bit more, well, let's go with the word pokiness or something like that, something that kind of cuts through the mix but don't have to like quadruple track something, sign me up. That sounds interesting. Can I give yeah, one of these type of guitars a try? And yeah, 
As I mentioned, this video we are seeing here on YouTube is also the weekend watch for this week. And there's no reason to do that segment separately. Go check it out, links below in the show notes for this one. And let's jump to the next question, which is, of course, from a user whose name is Game Over. And he commented on my how to get a perfect guitar tone for Synthwave. And he just says, the 80s was the future of music. No surprise, this is coming back. Uh, first of all, was was 80s the future of music? <laughs> That's an interesting comment, mm. I'd say. Yeah. I mean, I guess in a way, I mean, I, I wasn't around as a as a music listener in the 80s when this music was fresh. Yes. I was a little baby or whatever, so I, I didn't know. But I feel like when you listen to a lot of 80s music now, to me, it feels very dated. You know, the 80s is music which is very easy to tie to that time period, but it probably yeah. felt very futuristic, especially the electronic stuff when it came out. And music yeah. goes in cycles, doesn't it? It tends to go in like 30-year cycles. So right now, the 80s is cool. No surprise it's coming yeah. back. I totally agree with Game Over. And that means that the 90s are probably coming back next, so we can look forward to more Britpop in five or ten years' time. That's exciting, yeah, which is actually it? something that uh, Rick Beato, in like Sting, kind of predicted in Rick Beato's uh, interview very recently. Like they are kind of uh, thinking like who's going to be the next Nirvana or something like that. That which is an interesting like thought play or whatever it's called. Uh, yeah, like eighties are definitely here. Like The Weeknd, for example, a gigantic, gigantic artist. That's very, very synthwave kind of stuff going on there. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, Bruno Mars and whoever I don't remember the other guy's name. They released an album as well. And there's also like there's R and B vibes, but there's also like like this kind of eighties synth vibes. Those sounds are just in right now, and I love it personally. Give me all your chorus pedals. I will put them in to good use. <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, I kind of agree. And comment number three on not the previous show, but the one before that. Nekji is also a, a first of all, loves the nickname. And, <laughs> and also, he's been a great friend of the channel for a long time as well. And he mentioned, well, like we talked about uh, Jared Dines' new band Sion and a bunch of other stuff as well. Which is that he's been a huge fan of Jared. Uh, so that's Jared. Oh, what's his last name? Completely, I'm blanking Dines. out right now. Dines. Channel for years, but I've never been able to get into any of his band. It's been, it's all been really good, but including the more than just myself song that was in the article, not just my, my kind of metal. So he's talking about the new Zion band. Uh, still super happy for him though and it kicks ass that his band is at the top of the metal charts right now which is okay that's that's definitely like next level stuff then compared to some other bands YouTubers have had in the past wait is are they at the top of like the billboard metal charts because that's amazing uh, I'm gonna check as we yeah go. please google that because that, this is referring to Jared Dines's project with Howard Jones, the former singer of Killswitch Engage. And they've released an album, which again, I haven't listened to, which I need to go and listen to yeah. after we shoot this show. And we talked a little bit about YouTubers who have been in bands and musicians who have been musicians and come to YouTube and so on and how it works and how easy it is or how difficult it is to be seen as a serious musician if you first found fame as a YouTuber. And that's definitely something that Jared Dines did, but he's, you know, he's a great musician. He's a great drummer. He's a great guitar player. He's a, he's a pretty decent vocalist as well. He can, he can yeah. scream for sure. And he's done musical projects with quite a number of famous people. One project that we didn't mention the last time was Rest Repose, which he was in with Fluff. Uh, ja Fluff? Ryan Bruce, not Jared Dines. Um, and that was a fairly successful band on a certain level, but that was more of a known thing because of the YouTubers. I would say that was a band that was formed around them and they didn't join it. Jared also played shows with Trivium and has done a lot of stuff with Matt Heafy, and now he's doing stuff with the former Killswitch Engage singer and has become 
by the look of this comment, very successful. Have you found some information there while I've been uh, unfortunately waffling? Not. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Let me try. Yeah. You talk for 30 seconds while I search. <laughs> yeah, you do that. Uh, yeah, I think like if that's true, if they're at the top of any kind of chart, that is pretty amazing and actually kind of inspiring because um, I've definitely felt like there's some sort of gap between like YouTubers and I'm, I'm going to put this in quotes, real musicians. And like, even though some of the YouTubers are amazing musicians, I haven't seen that many who have been able to create music that kind of reaches a broader audience outside YouTube. And uh, this might be the first one who does it. Wow, I'm really losing my voice by now, by the way. Did you find anything? I'm also ask, asking the same question now. No, I haven't found no. it yet, but the album is out now. It's called yeah. Scion, the project, and the album is also called Scion. And yeah, I can't find any information on charts, but um, you know, I'm sure it's doing really well. And congratulations yeah. to the both of them for that. So that, that's a great thing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I got to check the album as well. The couple of singles sound very nice, and I, as I mentioned, uh, I really like Howard Jones's voice and his style. And the couple of songs I li did listen to were nice as well. So yeah, gonna give it a listen, definitely. Uh, yeah, and as we just mentioned, we are not we are not able to confirm or deny that they are at top of some charts, but yeah. In any case, I'm sure they are successful, and that's really cool. And as I mentioned, feels like one of the first more successful transitions from being like a YouTuber into a real artist. I'm putting "real" in quotes again because that, that's that's a bit controversial statement to say that they're not real. It's just like if they actually get some like big success, that's really really cool. And well done. Yeah. Thumbs up from me. Yep, well done to them. Again. I can't find the information, but maybe by next week there'll be something else out there to say yeah. where yeah. where they might have charted or whatever. But yeah, great yeah. to see YouTubers we'll keep... breaking out into the real world. Let's put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> let's put it that way. And that wraps up Cat Big Friday's episode number 39. Thank you so much for li listening, watching all of those things. Uh, again, I, I'd like to remind you that there's new merch available and there's a special discount for podcast listeners and viewers as well so get yourself something nice for the holidays this hoodie is nice and warm and it's just unlikely so why not <laughs> uh, I don't know where I'm going here uh, uh, next week I hope I'll be in better shape than I'm right now I think I need to get some like painkillers and something to help with my throat and my nose and everything this flu thing sucks. But yeah, thank you so much. And you know that everything is in the show notes. Check it out. Thank you, Rich, for joining me once again. Bye, podcast. Bye, podcast. <laughs>